that we built that has to be now we'll do this there is a background noise from somewhere i don't know We are ready. We are live. Okay. Uh, yes. Sorry. Good evening, friends. Welcome to the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India 22nd webinar. The we have we are really fortunate to have a uh, esteemed faculty with us, the Reed Nicholas. She is from Alfred Dupont Hospital, Wilmington, Delaware, USA. She is going to speak on a very interesting topic. At present, we are all talking about. Uh, uh, tagline flatten the curve for the COVID, and she is going to take this uh, topic in a different way. Let's flatten the curve of complication during deformity correction. I would like to introduce uh, briefly about her professional as well as her personal uh, aspect. Uh, she's uh, she did his uh, her fellowship from the Dupont Hospital. After that, uh, she also did a fellowship in deformity correction at the International Center for Limb Deformity, Baltimore with John Herzenberg. Then she became a consultant at uh, DuPont. Uh, at present, she's a director of club food program over there. And she's also a co-director of arthrogryposis um, condition. Over and about the professional career, she is a eminent leader. And at present, she's a second vice president of limb lengthening and uh, reconstructive surgery society. Something personal uh, from that what, are, what I found special by interacting with her. Most of us are an orthopedic surgeon, but she's an orthopedic patient also. And she had a three ACL tear. Both the knees are having an ACL tear. And she has undergo uh, three surgeries for that. So she knows what are the problems as a patient. So she is a unique combination of surgeon as well as patient. Uh, I shall also like to tell about the resiliency because in spite of this ACL injury, she continues to play tennis as well as she continues to run. So that is a really a very positive aspect about the, her uh, personality. She's also intellectually uh, like very humble. This was shared by me by the fellow Amit Nimade who visited Alfred uh, recently. And he said that uh, whenever there is a discussion going on, she is always very down to earth and she is always willing to understand and listen the other person's view. So she is completely without ego. And the, another point which he said is about the emotional stability. Very few of us can remain calm and composed, particularly when we are facing challenge during surgery. But she can maintain that uh, nature during surgery and she can crack uh, jokes even at that stage also. So with this uh, unique uh, information about her, I invite uh, her to speak uh, about her topic and uh, share her vast experience. Before that, let me uh, introduce our three panelists. We have Mangal Pariyar, who is also a very eminent person uh, in this Elizaro and the limb reconstruction field. Similarly, Vivek Srivastava, who is from Indore, a promising young uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and Kirti Ramnani from Vadodara. He's also a very expert in this uh, field. So they are going to share their cases with us after the talk. So I welcome Reed for your talk, please. Thank you so much. Let me share um, my screen. Hopefully I can do it correctly. All right, so let's flatten the curve of complications in limb deformity correction. This is a pretty big topic and um, I hope I can give some pearls and then in the end, we can give them back to each other. So I have really nothing to disclose about this talk. Um, we really are in unprecedented times right now. Across the world, we're trying to decrease the complications caused by the coronavirus. And there are many new treatments and vaccines on the horizon. But the, to eradicate this, we are going to have to start with the basic principles, socially distance ourselves and wear a mask. This will flatten the curve and there will be less compl complications. Sort of sounds like limb deformity, doesn't it? 
The objectives of this talk are to discuss the challenges in limb lengthening and deformity correction in terms of preoperative -oper pre preparation, interoper um, interoperative application, and postoperative management. The goal is to approach the curve, flatten the curve, and recover successfully. The hallmark of limb lengthening and deformity correction is pre-op planning. If my son can plan on Bone Ninja, so can you. Benjamin Franklin said it well, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. The first lesson, learn the principles. As Vince Mosca said in the introduction to his books, book, Principles and Management of Pediatric Foot and Ankle De um, Deformities, teach the principles, not just the techniques. Techniques will change, but principles are forever. Principles will help you achieve your best outcome in the most complex deformities, but we have to learn to speak the same language. Most importantly for me, we also have to find our mentors. For me, this list is critical for the best outcomes. Finding your mentors to share ideas with, use the experience of others will help better your outcomes. As we all know, limb deformity and reconstruction is not for the faint of heart. So, this is um, a patient who had um, a, well, he was a pedestrian struck by a motor vehicle. He had um, segmental uh, loss of bone and soft tissues of the right tibia. He um, had his femurs fixed, femur fixed with uh, flexible nails, but two months later he had had a hypertrophic non-union. The um, tibia, there was delayed hearing with an anterior defect, and the fixer was removed about five months later. He did heal the fibula, but he continued to have bone loss and incomplete union of the proximal and distal tibia. So what's wrong? You know, this is a young boy. boy. He um, should be healing. He's of normal weight. So you really have to think about the big picture. Well, it turns out the grandparents are smokers in the house and his vitamin D level was terrible. So, and he also had a poor diet. Um, <clears throat> so my, my, um, one of my mentors uh, asked me to see the patient. Well, this is a little bit crazy for me because I'm being asked by my mentor to see the patient. So I made a list of the issues that were, um, what I thought were a problem. And beyond the risk of the, na um, the initial injury, uh, injury, the probable sequestrum, and the angular deformities, the question was, why didn't this child heal? So we took him back to the OR um, about eight months after the initial uh, surgery. We removed the sclerotic bo bone, shortened and acutely corrected the alignment of the proximal tibia, um, corrected the alignment of the femur with guided growth. In, the, in addition, we supplemented his vitamin D, improved his nutrition, and removed uh, the nicotine from um, his environment. So I, you have to remember too, that this kid is um, very short. He is almost dysplastic. So um, I went a little crazy and I decided that I would use some Elizarovian principles and I actually um, gave him a long latency period and then um, tried to lengthen him through that proximal um, tibia. And it worked. So things that you can't forget, you have to remember that there are are that patient selection is important. There are some modifiable, there are some non-modifiable non um, factors which will affect the bone, but there are many modifiable factors. In the US, diet and exercise can be an impediment to healthy regenerate. So my favorite quote from the art of limb alignment is, he who, who uses an erroneous map will be lost before the journey begins. You cannot expect to plan good surgery from poor x-rays. We calibrate images in our institution using a one inch ball bearing. Um, I will go over and help uh, position for good x-rays if necessary. So here's another case. So here's this um, child whose long leg film was obtained. Um, we got some labs just to make sure there wasn't any signs of rickets. Uh, the vitamin D was actually normal, which is a miracle. Post-treatment, this is what you see. So what's the diagnosis? Well, actually, it was just inadequate positioning for an x-ray. So make sure you don't operate on normal bone. So another thing to think about is the etiology of limb length discrepancy. The limb length discrepancy prediction is designed for type one discrepancies. The etiology influences the pattern of discrepancy and complication. Remember that growth in inhibition may not be constant. 
There are multiple ways to calculate growth remaining and predicted discrepancies. All methods have their strengths and weaknesses. In this article by Dr. Little, he realized that regardless of the method used, unpredictable results occur in a proportion of patients. In this paper by John Birch, he um, definitely uh, emphasized that skeletal age should be used, not chronological age. And unfortunately for me, who uses the multiplier app all the time, um, the multiplier app was seen not to be as um, accurate in predicting the limb lengths. Um, <clears throat> so here's an, another case, um, courtesy of Dr. McKenzie. Um, this is a child who, um, whose predicted limb length discrepancy and maturity was done by a couple of different methods. So about this. here's an, another case, um, courtesy of Dr. McKenzie. Um, this is a child I'm who, um, whose predicted limb length discrepancy and maturity was done by know? a couple of different methods. So here's another, um, Thank you so much. Um, so the procedures to manage limb length discrepancy were done um, correctly, but he was still 2.5 centimeters short. So what did we do right? Well, x-rays were obtained yearly, um, and these were always weight-bearing, as long as they're um, of the age that they can weight-bear. The measurements were done appropriately. We acknowledge the fact that the hip to, um, that there can be discrepancy in both the pelvis and in the foot. We used, it a ca it used a calibrated system, which allowed direct measurement of bone segments. And we, used, we made sure that the skeletal and chronological ages were similar. So there are many ways to look at how you predict chronologic versus skeletal age. And I think it's important to make sure that you're doing at least one of these methods. Around the age of puberty, you can look at the elbow um, while they're, doing, they're growing rapidly. And a tape measure is definitely not as accurate as a block as we have dis um, discovered. So why didn't this prediction work? There was an overestimation of the limb length discrepancy due to angular deformity because the tibia was oblique to the grid. You also must consider sagittal deformities. Is there any flexion contracture or um, bony deformity that um, needs to be addressed? So preoperative deformity analysis and surgical planning um, will allow you to, to identify the, um, a deformity. And sometimes there are men, um, multiple, analyze the bone segments, to determine the osteotomy level, plan a perfect correction, of course, and achieve amazing results. Um, this is a slide from Sean Standard at Sinai, and I think it's a fabulous um, description of what we can do right. So if you don't um, speak the same language, our miscommunication may lead to less desirable outcomes. So, I like to use the um, mnemonic from the limb of um, the art of limb uh, alignment. I use the map the ABCs, measure the mechanical axis or the malorientation te uh, malalignment tests, analyze the joint lines, pick the deformed bone, find the apex of the of the deformity, cut the bone, and do correction gradually or acutely. I stick with the principles whether you like to use those. Um, the words from the principles of deformity correction or this book, either one works, but you must have a good map. So I also throw out all the tools that I can. So some of these difficult um, deformities, may I may need a three-dimensional uh, printout of the foot. So in this case, if you look at the um, x-ray analysis, you can see that there is really little help from an x-ray, but this 3D model helped me align my half pins in the appropriate um, position so that I did not um, put into compromise any of the anatomic structures because I really could not see with an x-ray where I was going. So throw, use all the tools that you have. So if you plan ahead, I think you can come up with a very nice correction. So <clears throat> Mark Dahl and Stuart Green, I think said it best in their book. All limb lengthening operations and the majority of deformity correction procedures have the potential to create secondary deformities in long bones, as well as contractures, subluxations, and dislocations of adjacent joints. Certain biologic tissues just don't lengthen easily. Nerve and blood vessels can be stretched slowly as we see in the <clears throat> repair of post-traumatic segmental loss. Um, 
fascia, tendons, and muscle tissues do resist traction. Bone wound deformities that, that occur during um, elongation are often the consequence of resistance from longitudinal fascial bands. Secondary joint problems are the result of resistance to elongation by the muscular tendinous structures. So we must consider all of these important things when we are lengthening. We want to try to avoid unwanted bony angulation during lengthening. Bone has a tendency to form with the uh, apex opposite to the thickest muscle or densest fascia. Listed are the def um, deforming forces um, of the calf musculature. Femoral, um, femoral deformation is caused by a number of structures. These are pretty predictable. The hamstrings um, and linea aspera can cause apex anterior deformity. The iliopsoas causes anterior angulation. Varus of the proximal femur is called the, caused by the hip abductors attached to the greater trochanter and the adductors attachment along the distal shaft. The iliotibial band is re responsible for valgus of the distal femur. As John Hertzenberg says, it's the bane of lengthening. And the adductor muscles can pull into um, and cause varus. You also have to look at the nerves. Um, this uh, study supports the efficacy of perineal nerve um, decompression, both pro prophylactically and therapeutically when a corrective varus osteotomy of the proximal tibia is performed. The results of this study suggest that the mechanism of nerve injury may be entrapment rather than what was initially thought of just as nerve stretch with lengthening. It is important to recognize that uh, which osseous and soft tissue corrections will place added stretch, or, um, stretch on the nerve and soft tissues. Recognition of the signs and symptoms of nerve, co nerve compression is imperative. If it is thought that the posterior tibial nerve will be at risk, a tarsal tunnel, tunnel decompression should be performed prophylactically. It is really tough to do this after the frame has already been applied. Um, so, the, um, this is uh, an, another case. Um, this is a 13 year old uh, boy. He is moderately overweight. He had a history of a septic um, arthritis um, when he was uh, a child. Um, he, had a, he has a terrible hip, but he is predicted to be nine centimeters short. So the way that we do it in our preoperative planning is that we really prepare the village. So they meet with our limb deformity team, which includes me, social work, physical therapy, a physical, uh, uh, a physician assistant, um, and possibly, uh, and always the parents, especially if they have a divided home. With the social work, we discuss homeschooling. Um, the family's usually complaining about how often they're gonna have to come with us, um, come to see us. We discuss the parent's work schedule. How are they going to make this happen? Um, I like to get the physical therapists involved right away because if we don't use them appropriately, we may get into all sorts of trouble. Um, and our physician assistant has a wonderful PowerPoint to really educate them on the device that we're planning to use the, um, and how they can best avoid complications at home. All right, so I'm most concerned about complications, so I'm going to avoid it. So here, here we go. Here is this, this kid. He has a terrible hip. I'm going to try to lengthen him seven centimeters. I know this is going to be a problem. I am preparing myself for the worst, but I'm going to really try for the best. So we lengthened him, and we were actually successful in not dislocating his hip. Um, a miracle. He was so happy. His legs turned straight. I did do a derotation around the nail, and he looks good. But I guess I didn't prepare the village perfectly because when he was finished lengthening, his father asked me if he could ride this hoverboard, which is probably the most dangerous toy out there. They stand on this, it's got wheels and they crash all the time. So when dad asked me, oh, he received this for Christmas, when can he ride it? I responded, never. Never, never, never. If he falls on this hip, we are done for. So um, anyway, I've given you about 40 slides on preoperative planning. I think this is the most important thing. You need to know what to expect, expect the un unexpected and plan for both the worst and the best. So now we're set to go into the operating room. We need to flatten the curve interoperatively. 
So there are a number of goals to consider. We need to protect the joints. We need to build a stable construct. We need to maximize our regenerate quality. We really need to perform a safe osteotomy or corticotomy. Um, I want to, to my best ability, avoid pin track and wire infections, or at least prepare the family on what to look for. Um, we need to avoid soft tissue restraints and achieve our preoperative plan. I'm not going to discuss um, the techniques today. There are obviously many ways that you can um, skin a cat and many ways that we can perform these deformity corrections. Um, but we need to stick um, to the principles. As Elizaroff stated, we need to create a non-displaced fracture with a sparing corticotomy. We need to perform, uh, preserve that endosteal and periosteal blood supply. We need to minimize heat generation, really reduce our amount of periosteal stripping soft tissue releases as needed, not after they are needed, but before they're needed. Um, and don't forget that sagittal plane. It is just as important to notice as the coronal plane. Um, I had a friend who was so excited to use one of our lengthening nails and she trained in fellowship with me and she was, wanted to make sure I knew that um, she had put this nail in before I did. And I said, oh, so did you release the IT band for your lengthening? And she asked, no, why? why? Um, so if you don't know all of the principles and you don't apply these, trouble can happen. So although she got to put the nail in first and lengthened her patient, um, I was very concerned that she hadn't stuck to the principles. So please try to avoid, avoid issues. So we know that subluxations and dislocations are often difficult to treat. By testing the soft tissues and releasing as needed preoperatively or at the beginning of your case, or even at a, a different day, many challenges can be avoided. Moderate um, knee instability can be bridged with external fixators. Remember that congenital problems are often more difficult and challenging, but fun to uh, treat than post-traumatic. Not all the time though. So compartment syndrome is also a risk just to realize that even uh, that with IM lengthenings and tibial osteotomies, this can be a problem. Um, prophylactic uh, anterior fasciotomies of the tibia may help avoid um, the compart compartment syndrome. So this is another case. Um, this is a child with congenital femoral deficiency. He's about 11 in this first picture. Um, his, he's been treated for hip dysplasia um, in the past. Um, there was preparatory surgery performed by the esteemed Dr. Thacker. Um, he did a VDRO, he did a relative neck, uh, neck lengthening. And then um, after this had healed, he prepared for um, the first intramedullary uh, lengthening. So everything was going great. He lengthened about 1.6 uh, centimeters. The hip was looking good, no problems, but then something happened. Somewhere between the 1.6 and the 3.7 centimeters, uh, the hip started to subluxate. So you can't continue. You must stop, don't blast through this. It will not work. You will be in really bad straits. So he smartly took this nail back, shortened it by um, an, about a centimeter. The hip uh, stationed a little bit better and he stopped lengthening. And this doesn't matter if you're using an external fixator or an intramedullary lengthening device. It really shows that even though he had done preparatory surgery, the Dega osteotomy was just not enough to hold that femoral head. So therefore a triple um, anominate osteotomy was performed. Um, no more lengthening was suggested and the PIPSU disease was done on the other side. So here's another congenital case. This is a, a younger child, she's about 10. She has multiple problems. Um, you can see that her hip is not beautiful. She had bilateral hip dis, um, dysplasia. It was treated more like a DDH, which is probably not the diagnosis in this case. She has congenital femoral deficiency. She also has that valgus um, knee. And if you look to the right, um, I, I wish I had a video of this, but her knee is grossly unstable. So we are not going to make this mistake again. So we made sure we did um, a pretty substantial preparatory surgery, but she took forever to heal. Remember when I talked about patient selection and knowing um, the modifiable and non-modifiable factors, these are super important for this. You can see that there's a broken screw in the bottom x-ray. Um, this is because this really took, until I threatened the bone with a bone stimulator, uh, she came in to pick it up uh, about 10 months later and the darn bone had healed. But her vitamin D had, level had been very low 
Um, and I made sure that I pushed for that every time, but the family was just not as receptive. But once they got on board and started to replace her um, vitamin D and feed her better, um, we did make some progress. But I haven't addressed the knee yet. She's young um, and that will happen next, but I will have to address the knee before I begin to, to take care of that 6.5 centimeter lengthening. So principles of building a stable frame. Don't forget your principles. Everybody, I feel like I'm speaking to the choir here. Know the anatomy, the stability. You wanna make the bone as stable as possible. You wanna look at the frame to bone distance, the ring diameter, the working distance, pin spread, fixation points. All of these are so important for when you address the modern American modern US um, player. So you can see, um, I, if anyone has ever trained here, they know Dr. Bowen, this is what we call the Dr. Bowen special. Um, Dr. Bowen likes to drop off patients at your door. I just want you to meet her or him. I just want you to say hello and then you can take care of this fine young man. So anyway, that's usually it. right at the last patient when clinic is about to finish and here is your next adventure. So one thing to look at in this pre-op planning, number one, um, he is very large. He weighs about 415 pounds. So what is that 200 and something kilograms? Um, don't try to get both legs on one x-ray film. Um, you will get poor quality films. Um, you need to get a, I prefer a, a, a sagittal profile in full extension so I know what bony and soft tissue components there are. So what is stable? Um, I thought I'd put on a pretty nice frame here. I did my two gray arthrodesis. I had four half pins. Um, I think I had three uh, half pins and a wire up, up top. Well, maybe this one wasn't stable enough for um, this fine young man. Um, so I, I think I could have changed a few choices. I could have considered double stacking my ring proximally. That is a two third or a three fifths ring. Um, maybe it was not strong enough to support um, his weight, but I was afraid of, or I would prefer not to drop that off anatomy too low. But honestly, more translation for him wouldn't have mattered because it would have been hidden by his body habitus. Um, I do make sure that I, I work very hard on how I put my pins in to not generate any heat. Um, I use the biggest pins I can. Um, I think I'll do a little bit better too about angling it in the predicted uh, deformity direction. So here is um, some other ways that we can flatten the curve. How we place our half pins as you just saw is actually important. Um, one bit of advice is that you can anticipate what your um, angulation deformity is going to be when you're lengthening or correcting. So you can put your pins or circular rings at five to seven degree, at a five to seven degree angle opposite to the expected um, angulation. Um, the pin coating, it matters in order to help stabilize the pin bone interface. I also use a um, hydroxyapatite coated wire now and my pins generally have HA coating well past or well onto the shank um, so that the there's much exposed HA and it, I hope that it's forming a better biologic um, uh, bind. Um, but the research has not borne out that it decreases infection. Um, there are some other things on the horizon. Um, one that looks promising for, ant for an anti-infection um, uh, take is the iodine supported titanium. Um, <clears throat> so another really important thing is how do you start lengthening? When do you start? How fast do you do it? Um, I usually wait five to seven days in my patients. Um, but if I have a very tough deformity or I've done any acute correction at the time um, of the frame application, which is not typical, but we saw in that first case with the pedestrian versus MVA, I did do some correction there. So I'll have a de more delayed um, latency period. Adults, you may not, um, you may need to wait even longer. Um, and your rate. So along the uh, amount of elongation per day um, can be very important. I make sure that they do it three to four times a day. Um, I really like to go slowly in the tibias and congenital cases. Um, if you're not making good regenerate, just slow down. I'm really learning that that is a key to um, how I do things. Now, if I polled all of you about how you do your pin care, 
everyone would have a different answer. Um, check it at all show that if you um, put uh, 0.2, uh, sorry, yeah, 0.2% PHMV, it's an anti uh, um, gauze, you can decrease your rate. I, as you can see in this um, the picture of the external fixator, I use a silver impregnated uh, sponge at least in the first week while um, everything is healing. Um, I do, do use Ozeroff sponges. Um, your makeup sponges to about the same material and much cheaper. Um, in order to, to keep the sponges close to the pins, I use a, a binder clip from our local office store that decreases the cost. So however you do it, um, I can't give you enough research to say we have a, a perfect way. So. Our goal is to decrease the uh, bone healing index, to get them out of a frame faster, to get them walking faster. Um, there are many things that um, researchers are looking at. Um, some things with some positive uh, outcomes or low intensity pulsed um, ultrasounds. Um, they're also looking into the development of a, of a multiple growth factor delivery system for if the regenerate is not um, healing well. We want to prevent fractures or bending of the regenerate after all that work. Just remember that there is a 34% uh, uh, rate of fracture in congenital femoral deficiency. So whether you cast or brace or you supplement your um, fixation or your correction with rush rods or I've been using a slim nail lately, it does not matter. But you have to look at your regenerate and be honest with yourself to make sure that you really think that it can sustain um, without bending or breaking. So here is um, a case. This is a, um, an eight-year-old who had a double level um, deformity correction. He has type four, I mean, sorry, type 3C uh, fibular hemimelia. Um, and he was, he's already had a super ankle. He has some deformity in his foot, which I am not correcting in this case. Um, he had been, he, he was just done with the, the frame. And I had left him in an extra month because I didn't think that proximal regenerate was perfect. Uh, but I'm like, yeah, it'll be okay. I'm gonna put him in a long leg cast. I'm gonna make him non-weight bearing and he's gonna be the perfect angel and do everything I say. Well, here he is, comes out. I put him in a long leg cast and then so disappointing. He starts to bend through that proximal regenerate. The distal osteotomy healed beautifully, um, but the proximal really lost its, its, um, lost its umph. So I took him back to the operating room and I did what I probably should have done the first time, thinking that that regenerate was a, a problem. Um, I should have fortified it with some kind of, fit of uh, rod, whether it was a rush rod or a flex nail or anything, um, and I didn't do that. So this was probably one of the most difficult nailings I've done. Um, and I'm happy now, but he's back in a cast, which makes him very sad during the summer. All right, so here is, um, this was a home run. Boy, this is going to be easy. This is an 18 year old um, who had a 1.8 centimeter difference. And some would say, why are you even lengthening for that? And I said, no, this is gonna be easy. This is why we have some specialized devices now that we can use. Um, his, the, the deformity is playing into his scoliotic curve. He's gonna, he hates wearing a shoe lift, no problem, I got this. Well, he left the hospital, walked up the stairs of his house and bent the nail. So now I have, have this very easy lengthening going on and I have to watch it hoping that this very expensive nail will not break and he's a tall adult so I got lucky in this case but you really need to prepare for anything and limb lengthening again is not for the faint of heart and we really have to plan correctly. So this is the last case I'm going to present. Um, you really need to have many tools in your toolbox. So this is a, a child that was actually um, treated in another institution, had 22 centimeters of um, length performed prior to see me, the ankle fusion, you can epiphysiodesis on the contralateral side. I knew that when I lengthened him his last five centimeters that his uh, anatomic axis was in valgus and it would probably continue that way. So my plan was to take out the nail at some point and do an acute osteotomy and put a plate or something on. Well, he really 
was very slow to heal, especially in that anterior tibia. And he was must have been applying a lot of weight because you can weight bear in this particular nail um, to the distal screws. And he was complaining, complaining, complaining of the distal screws. There was no infection. There was maybe a little lucency around those nails, but I had to do something. So the first thing I did was I actually shortened him. Um, I compressed that regenerate, which I think is a very smart thing to do. Um, he was also, I think, a little too long, which may have been playing into that valgus deformity. So this is what, um, Actually, a friend of mine had helped me think through this. Again, always ask friends, uh, get other experiences. Uh, a couple of people in the room can make your experience from 10 years to 60 in a matter of seconds, and you can get some great ideas. So I did my planning accordingly. I found my um, the apex of my deformity. I thought, oh, I'll just correct it. I'll do an, a fixator-assisted plating and all as well. But... I was recommended to do something a little different. So I actually used a trauma nail to correct this deformity um, with blocking screws. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go through all of this, but one of the keys is you put this diamond, this, this red line that you see actually is going to the skin and you're gonna mark that spot with a little, um, like a staple or something, uh, radio uh, opaque. And then you, drill, your, you put your, um, your reamers going that direction. Um, you first put your Steinman pin, um, then, you make your, uh, then you put your blocking screws, and then you make your osteotomy. And what happens is that you're able to correct with your nail and make a straight bone. So bring out all the tools in your toolbox. Ask friends if they have other things that they really um, like. So I've spent a lot of time talking about pre-op planning. It is the, probably to me the most critical part. You know, as we always talk about, any monkey can do surgery, but I don't really think that's true. But anticipate what could go wrong, because then if you have a good roadmap, you will be, you'll never be lost on your journey. Know your patient, know, understand them, see what their hangups are. Is their social situation good enough to come back to your office every week? Because if it's not and they get lost to follow up, that is a disaster. Prepare their village. The more knowledge they get um, before surgery, you know, even what clothes they can wear over an external fixed or um, what food to avoid like sodas, et cetera, they will be more fit for their journey. So flatten the curve of complications. If you do all of these steps, I really think that you can come up with some pretty amazing results. Um, so thank you so much for having me today. This has really been an honor. This is my COVID crazy team. Every Friday we dress up in some crazy outfit. Um, and then my, um, unfortunately I choose this picture to post on um, POSNA and I didn't realize that we're gonna use it, but oh well, this is my family and um, I will take any questions that you have. Yes, thank, thank you. you Ray. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful explanation about the variety of uh, cases and the challenges which we face during the limb lengthening and the deformity correction. Yes, we have a few questions. I would ask uh, Kirti to uh, start sharing the question. Kirti, please. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, and Kirti, also start your video so people can see you. My host has stopped the video, so host has to do it. Yeah. You can start yeah. speaking, Kirti, meanwhile. Yeah. We'll get uh, the video. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Nicole, for a uh, lucid presentation. So, Dr. Taral Nagda has asked a question. What will be your indications for prophylactic fasciotomy? When will you go for a prophylactic fasciotomy? Um, for tibial lengthenings, I, I will tell you, I um, I couldn't find the discussion, but I had thought I had heard someone say, oh, well, we really don't do that anymore because some people complain about the hernia that you could get over that um, anterolateral compartment. But then I had another person whisper in my ear saying, I just had a compartment syndrome. So two things. Um, number one, if you have... One thing to think about if you're doing, um, whether you're doing a fixed or assisted lengthening with a nail, if those reamings as they go out the back, if you're reaming for a nail, um, you may want to vent the, um, the bone anteriorly instead of posteriorly to try to de decrease your risk of posterior compartment syndrome. Um, I typically, 
honestly, I think I haven't done an anterior fasciotomy about once. And now that I've heard more people talking about, you know, compartment syndrome, that is just a risk I don't really want to take on. It, I mean, I just think there's so much to think about. So I generally do an anterior fasciotomy in my tibial osteotomies. So, Dr. Rajiv Nigandi, he has four questions. So I'll put it one okay. by one. First is, uh, what's your youngest stage age to start lengthening? Youngest um, age. Youngest age. So, um, the child with the fibular hemimelia, I did him. I did his first lengthening um, at about three. I'm not sure. I have become much more. I really talked to the family. You know. Where, when I trained with, with Drawer and John, they usually do their first lengthening either with the super ankle or they do it um, at age four so that they can equalize their limb lengths before kindergarten. I'm not sure that that's important. And I think that um, listening to the families when they're ready to lengthen is, in, is appropriate. And also you can kind of feel with the, the child if they're going to be able to tolerate that. So I do think you can lengthen early. Um, I will tell you, I have started to um, push the envelope a little bit later to begin my lengthening because I think they can participate it, um, participate in physical therapy a little bit better. So the second question is, he wants uh, to you to speak on upper limb lengthening, tips for upper limb lengthening. Do I have to? <laughs> um, I have not, honestly, I don't think that I am the right person to talk to about that because I really, I have an upper extremity specialist here um, that I don't see many of, you know, for like the tar babies go to her. Um, she spoke to, with you guys a few weeks ago. Um, I've done some, I just haven't done enough to, to comment. They keep me in the, in the stinky feet. Yeah. And your views on lengthening in achondroplasics and cosmetic lengthening. So, um, Interesting that, you know, training with uh, Hertzenberg and Paley, I didn't think twice about lengthening an achondroplastic uh, dwarfs. I thought it was great. That was what you should do. You know, now I'm here at DuPont and Will McKenzie is, it does more alignment surgery um, because he is very involved with the little people of America. So I've seen now two very different perspectives and um, I do think it matters what the family wants. You know, some people say, uh, should you be lengthening a child that really can't speak to what their desires are going to be when they become adults? Um, so I think it's a very personal decision. I have no problem doing the lengthening though. And for cosmetic lengthening, um, I, I actually just did a talk for um, POSNA about doing very small lengthenings, very, you know, like 1.6, 1.8. Um, and is that okay? Or should we just make sure that they have an epistudesis or just force them to wear a shoe lift? Um, I'm five feet, four inches tall. When I speak, I'm five, eight, I hope. Um, but I'm not, I'm really short. And um, I think that when I was doing this talk for, to compare epistudesis with these, you know, very short lengthenings with the nail, um, I read some stuff on the psychology of height. So I think for, for me to say that cosmetic lengthening is not necessary, we should never do it, is probably not true. Um, it's a big financial investment. Um, and certainly things can go very, very wrong, but things can be very, very right too. And I think we're getting safer technologies. Um, but as I said in this whole talk, if you ignore the principles, even when you're doing a uh, you know, three to five centimeter lengthening or less, you're going to get into trouble. So education. I, I, want to, I want to butt in with a couple of questions related to this read. Sure. Uh, one is, uh, you know, in uh, India, especially, where we are not very, uh, our infrastructure, etc., is not very appropriate for differently abled people. And uh, in achondroplasia, the lack of height is certainly a challenge, you know? So yes. whereas in, in the US, you have, uh, uh, you know, you can have, you can have your home kind of built 
to right. uh, for your height uh, so generally over here in situations where that kind of help is not available would you kind of change your uh, would you change your outlook in terms of achondroplasia uh, my outlook is what is what I... is the rather what is the argument if if the patient is willing yes you know when when i was doing my fellowship the uh, the uh, lpa had kind of agitations against drawer and john for lengthening uh, achondroplastics with the with saying that you know you are telling them that this is ab- they are abnormal and all that kind of stuff but i think it's it's a pretty safe thing and it helps them Yes. I think the world in the US is made for people that are five feet tall. Um, I, I really have, I have no issues with lengthening um, acons. I, I really don't. It, here, I, I just am a little bit quieter when I say that. But most people come here because they want angular correction, not necessarily lengthening because of, of Will's connection with the LPA. Um, but I agree. I mean, I have, I think especially now that we we do know how to do lengthening pretty well. Um, we certainly have, you know, we haven't minimized the risks, but I think that things are getting a little bit easier to do it. We've, you know, our people who have come before us have made some mistakes that were, you know, we learn from, and I, I think our devices are getting better. Um, they're still expensive. Um, so I, I agree with you. You know, I think it's a family choice. And if they want to be lengthened, I, I see no problem with it. Um, as long as they're being lengthened in a, um, in a proportional way, because they can look kind of funny. I had this, I had a girl that came in with a pair of boots on. And I said, what is your problem? Why do you want to be lengthened? And, and I said, you look tall, you, you know, you're above five feet. Um, I'm not much taller than you. And then um, she cleverly took off her shoes and inside she had a wedged flip flop that was this, she had a heel this high that was stuck in her shoes so that she could look like she was taller. So Mm -hmm. I think the psychology of height is important. And if it's something that's important to you, there's no problem. Right. And the second question related to that was for cosmetic lengthening. We have now the uh, implantable nails available. I've done, I think, uh, five cases where we've done uh, cosmetic lengthening in uh, adults. But would you, if you have a patient uh, who cannot afford uh, implantable nail, would you and very much wants cosmetic lengthening, would you do a cosmetic lengthening using a frame? Well, okay, so I will say in one case that I, I had in fellowship makes me question whether I do that with a, um, a frame. Because the, the, the scarring from external fixators is much more significant than, than the implantable nail. I mean, there's still holes, but it's, it's much more obvious. It depends on the psychology of the patient. If the patient is very fixated on what the scar is going to look like, then I would say, no, I wouldn't do it because this, this child had come from, um, or he was an adult, but he had come from another country. He had been lengthened multiple times and he was absolutely obsessed with the scar. Now he, his tibia was way too long compared to the femur. And Dror just told him to just pull up his pants and he would look better because he was obviously mentally challenged by too many parts of this that I, I think you have to be very careful. Um, you know, it's not impossible, but I, I think I'd be, I'd be more re- reluctant. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, having done a few with this nail, I don't think I would do a cosmetic lengthening with a frame it's just too much uh, trouble. Too much trouble the patients are uh, they're not they're difficult patients you know they say that uh, you know how can you get normal more normal if anything they are going to lose something in terms of function and with a frame to do a lengthening is 
uh, not a good idea because sometimes they want unreasonable lengths. So yes, if we have as and when in India it becomes available more freely, it's very expensive for India right now. Yeah. But uh, that is probably the only uh, thing that we sh should. The reason I bring this up is uh, because oftentimes this is one of the uh, reasons why people will approach orthopedic surgeons that I want to get um, you know, length, I want to gain height. And relatively inexperienced the people with lengthening will oblige the patient. So uh, cosmetic lengthening is actually the apex of illicit surgery. It's only after you've had enough complications at the base <laughs> of the pyramid uh, that you should be doing cosmetic lengthening. There are too many complications. Well, that's, why, that's why I told you that, that silly story about someone who I trained with and Fabulous surgeon, but was so proud to tell me, oh, I put the first lengthening inhale and I beat you. And I ask a very simple question. Did you, did you lengthen the IT band? Would he, she had no, no clue why I would ask that question. And that is one conversation. You know, I know that you don't have as many intramedullary lengthening nails over there, but um, boy, we, you know, every, I was just operating a, a fabulous fellow that we have right now. But the first thing they said to me when we were doing a femoral, we were putting in a femoral lengthening nail. Um, you know, it's a solid nail. I have to make the ostomy. She's just like, oh, it's just like putting a trauma nail in. I put plenty of those in. I was like, oh my gosh, what have I not taught you? And then, you know, they, we weren't, she wasn't, or I won't sell that person out, but the resident and the fellow needed to hold the leg so that we wouldn't lose the reduction. And you know, things happen and it just made it a longer nail insertion. But if you don't know your device and you'll see how dangerous it is, it is when these become super available in India, it, it is amazing. You're, you're listening to these people saying, oh, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And they're not sticking with the principles. Yeah. And um, you know, they're, they get tight, they, you know, especially if it's a congenital and you all of a sudden you have a hip dislocation. It can happen to anyone. Feldman has um, presented some great talks on, you know, one to two centimeters of lengthening and the hip pops out. Um, that's, that's a big problem. And if you don't know how to, to recover from your complications, that's an even bigger problem. Absolutely. Luckily, I have friends here. <laughs> Kirti, next question. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Atul Bhaskar is asking, if you get a poor region rate while lengthening, do you uh, use a bone marrow or BMP to augment it? So I, um, I have not had to do that. Um, uh, I think that shortening, I think that compressing or slowing down as you're seeing that regenerate is really important. There's nothing wrong with doing it, but I actually have not done that yet um, because I've been able to save the regenerate. Um, either by slowing down, taking a break, even though mentally that is very challenging for both the family and me. You know, if you're saying, you know, you've got a really big deformity and they're gonna be in a frame for months and months, like that child with fibular hemimelia, clearly the regenerate was not ready for me to remove the frame. It wasn't, there's a big line right through it that tells me something is going wrong. And I just didn't wanna to listen to it because the kid was annoying me and he was ready to get out of the frame. Um, I may, you know, I might have benefited from going a little sooner and putting, you know, injecting something, but I think that shortening and compression or just slowing down before you get to that spot is a better idea. Any, any role of bone marrow aspiration uh, for a I think better region, right? I think that there is probably a role. I mean, they're doing, Yopes just put out um, a pretty, it was in 2015, I think, um, looking at um, advances in limb deformity. I mean, yes, they're looking at different kinds. They want, what I had said in that one slide was if you can get a cocktail that, that has a very good way of putting it into the regenerate, that would be a great idea. And I think there is research going on for that. But the less you have to put in and the more you can use your own body host, I, I do think that the child with the pedestrian hit the mentor that sent me that patient is the number one person who tells me always to look at the nutrition status and the vitamin D level. I mean, that kid's vitamin D level, he had, it was nothing. And once we got the whole host, 
back to where it needed to be, that, that really did help to heal things. Uh, Kirti, let me just butt in there. Um, I've had a few of these, uh, you know, delayed consolidations. And the most important, as she pointed out, is uh, to monitor the regenerate. Lengthening is not a surgery, again, which she pointed out, that you put on the frame and then teach the patient to distract one millimeter per day and then come back after 60 days when the length is achieved. No, they have to be monitored at regular intervals. And depending on how the regenerate is performing, you may decide to uh, slow down or it's better to decide to slow down the regenerate. So you're less likely to have trouble. In spite of that, sometimes you have trouble. Now, the ones that I have done, uh, they've always had, I, I do an ultrasound to look for what is there. And there is usually fluid inside. When I open it, there is a membrane which lines that cyst. So I personally don't think that bone marrow injection is going to work. What is happening here is, this is a patient who is already getting a little irritable in terms of how long this treatment is taking. So whatever I want to do now, there has to be no if and but about it. So for me, uh, opening that up, curating out the uh, uh, membrane through a small incision, just like the corticotomy, and then packing it with cancellous bone graft is the thing to do. Once you, you find a, a defect in the um, regenerate. If you are, you know, it's not ossifying well, but you can see sort of uh, lines on the uh, medial and lateral side, anterior and posterior. There, yes, you just slow down and it will uh, catch up. And all the other stuff, you know, vitamin D, nutrition, um, that kind of... I usually say vitamin D is not the only answer to bone health, but it's a really easy thing to give and it's very hard to get in your diet. So I have a, I have a spiel for that, but I think you're right too. And I think you, I think sometimes when you're lengthening and you're correcting these very large deformities, you might have a multiple uh, lay, you know, multiple osteotomies. It's hard to be very objective in what your outcome is. So you have to be true to yourself that that regenerate's not looking so good at, you know, a six weeks into this. And you, you need to change something. You need to change the, the rate that you're elongating. You need to go backwards. You need to take a break. Um, but I think that being honest with yourself that it's not going quite as well as you think it is may save you a problem at the end. Is there any role of local stimulation techniques? Yeah, I mean, I, that, I presented that briefly that um, there is some, some positive, there are some positive results for ultrasound and some, um, some uh, kind of e-stim um, not perfect, but looks like it does. The stimulation may help, um, but I, I think more research is going on with that. I've used it in a sort of belts and braces approach. I will graft it if the patient can afford. Then uh, they will get an e stim, but I, I wouldn't rely. The data doesn't support the use of uh, e stim alone. So all right, mm -hmm. patient can afford, and I want to do as much as possible patient can afford it, uh, use it, but not alone, especially in is our it situation. It's not easy to get it. Is it hard to get East Dam over there? Uh, yeah, it, you, they oh, had it earlier, it's after but here. now the patients have to kind of, someone coming from the US will uh, carry it for them kind of thing. That's how it, it works now. It's not I available mean, from them here. The one, the, the uh, CFD patient that I presented, Literally, it took us three months to get the e-stim. The day the guy had come to the hospital to deliver it, we got an x-ray and it was healed. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's painful. Because we I had actually taken her back to the OR to take out her A-plates because her, her um, knee, her alignment was corrected. And that thing was still not healed. And I was going to take it down and put a plate on and bone graft it. And Mahir and I talked and we're like, you know what? It's a big surgery. She's she, you know, she's not nutritionally stable yet. Let's not do this. And so, luckily, you know, it worked in our favor, and she finally healed. But that knee is going to be a whole nother story. She's it's that's got some stabilization issues. Right. Um, 
Yeah, any more questions or we can go on yeah, to your... Are, uh, no, no, there, there are many questions pending. Okay. So, what is the threshold for knee contractures while you are lengthening the femur? Um, one, look at what your knee range of motion is before you start. If you need a rectus release, you know, some of us are using Botox. I use Botox in that one child with the hoverboard. Um, I, if you, if I lose, um, if I, if I go below, um, 45 degrees, I'm definitely slop, stopping and slowing down. So I am pretty aggressive at making sure I'm 45 is, I, I'm, that's pushing it. I, I like them to really, I don't want them to lose at all. So I tell the family as I'm preparing my village that PT is not an optional thing. Home stretching is not an optional thing. And if I need to do preparatory surgery before we start, I'm gonna do that. If it gets too tight, I tell them I'm gonna go backwards and I'm going to, you're gonna lose some of your length because we have to maintain our soft tissue envelope or the knee's gonna dislocate or the hip's gonna dislocate. You know, something bad is going to happen. So I'm, I'm pretty adamant about that. Um, yeah, getting getting a longer limb at the at the cost of function is not a winning uh, proposition. So you have to uh, ensure that there is good therapy going on. Luckily, now we have one of uh, uh, Anil Bhave's uh, two-hour lectures on the net. So uh, oh. you know, even people whose therapists are not used to that can can look at that and see how things need to be uh, treated. There's and, a lot of work that goes into that. I don't know if Anil's brace has come to you either. I mean, his bracing techniques are really good. Anil's a magician. And there are lots of things that you can do to try to save a knee, um, but good therapy techniques. Um, I think Fran, uh, one of uh, Dror Perley's physical therapists, has a fantastic talk on how to manage soft tissues. So the other thing that I've noticed is a really big um, benefit is to have your therapists be very well educated in what they're doing. So people that have trained with Anil or trained with Fran, or I have a really good therapist here, that is important because sometimes they don't understand what surgery you did and what the goals of, of their therapy are and why you know going once a week is not gonna cut it when you're trying to achieve seven centimeters of length. Yeah. But so don't occasionally be I, I have this, stop. I have this similar, I have a similar issue where uh, we will send patients uh, to the to to the custody of a therapist closer to home, you know, so they don't have to come. But when they come on the follow up, they're not doing what is uh, needed. So the first thing to do would be to speak to the therapist, get my therapist to speak to them, and see if they can understand what's happening. If it's not happening, then sometimes the patient may need you know to get admitted for five seven days to get good therapy here and then go back and continue that. And luckily now with WhatsApp and stuff, they can uh, you know, keep a follow up by video with us, with the therapist. So I can see, is he walking properly? Is he mobilizing properly? And if that's not the case, then they, they need to uh, come back. Despite whatever it may be in terms of distance and all that, that is something and usually the advice I give to uh, patients in terms of, I treat quite a few outstation patients. So how long am I going to stay in, in Mumbai? And that's going to be the initial period of lengthening. You're definitely going to be in Mumbai. If you are doing well, if your exercises are going well, your uh, ambulation is going well, your pin site care is going well, then we'll send you home. And you can follow up from there um, on video. But if it's not, then you would need to stay in till the lengthening is over because that's the time when all these issues happen. During the consolidation phase, there's no problem. So, you know, I, I try to ensure that during the time that they are likely to have trouble, they are closer to me and not uh, very far away. Limb deformity is a team sport and the, and the center of our team is the patient. But if we don't have good communication among all the, part, all the players, you won't have as good an outcome. 
So is there any role of uh, manipulation under general anesthesia if you find uh, that your patient is getting stiff while lengthening? I would prefer to be able to either back them up, you know, shorten what you've gotten so far, um, work on manipulative techniques. I mean, sure, I think you can, I, I don't typically have to go back to the OR, but certainly you, you wanna know what's, what's causing that problem. Is it a pin that's too near a nerve that's irritating them? Is, is um, have they lengthened too fast? Um, do they need any other, is their physical therapy going, going well? well. Um, have you, I don't know, you guys can maybe answer that question too. I mean, I have not, I typically don't have to take them. When I'm in the OR though, let's say I'm, you know, I. Some of my fibular hemimilias, that one that I showed you, you know, I worked on his knee before I took off the frame because he liked to hold it externally rotated and flexed to 90 all the time. But I, I had a brace on him so that he wouldn't do that. But I will tell you that when I finally went to take the, the um, frame off, before I did that, I did manipulate. But it was only because I had a 10 degree flexion contracture. Yeah, otherwise, in general, to achieve flexion, I think uh, manipulation is, is the wrong thing. If a patient is getting stiff, there is some, there is some mismatch in the lengthening, um, in the uh, physio. And there are times when you have to call it a day that, okay, I will do this lengthening in two stages. Yeah. One of our problems is that uh, at young ages, patients get told, oh, okay, wait till you're 16, and then we can do the lengthening in one go. And I have to tell patients that, no, I am going to do your lengthening in two or maybe three uh, sessions. I'm not interested. It's better to have multiple small lengthenings uh, in terms of function than to have one long um, lengthening. And that is something which still is prevalent in our situation where, okay, you know, wait till you're 16 and your length discrepancy is stabilized and then we will lengthen the whole thing. No. Uh, generally, I, I would prefer to have uh, physiotherapy. If that doesn't work, then surgical options, once the fixator is, is out, to correct this uh, lengthening. Manipulation under anesthesia, I think, is not. A lot of equinus deformities, which develop during lengthening, despite putting on a sandal and straps, they respond very well to the patient stretching. And this is what she was talking about, Anil's uh, splints or constant uh, extension force on the uh, uh, knee joint to correct knee flexion deformities. Prevention, more than correction, but even if it does happen, constant stretching at home, uh, I think does better than a stretching under anesthesia. And you can so break I don't things. Do I mean, yeah, I think yeah. I, I only do the, you know, at the end of lengthening, but before I take the frame off, like you cannot start manipulating that new regenerate. Um, that's another thing I'm, I'm very careful with when the way I, and this is definitely a, a Hertzenbergism, very, very careful about the way I take off that frame, making sure that the people that are training with me know that, hey, it's not, it's, it's, it's a simple frame removal, but if you hold the leg and you just sort of hold it by the toes and we start to bend through that regenerate, that would be a problem. So, you know, teaching even the trainees, the little, details about limb lengthening and, and you know, just as simple as taking off a frame can be trouble. The other thing I was thinking about is if the intermedullary lengthening nails come to you, another um, thing that I think some people may overlook is you can't brace or you can't put um, a, like the sandal splint that you would put on the external fixator to hold the foot from getting that equinus contracture, but you have to put a brace on an ankle foot orthosis something, um, whether you're doing, and if you're doing a femur, I usually put a hinged brace on that I can lock out at night. Um, so you're not not bracing. That is one of the critical steps so that you don't develop a contracture. I agree. Okay. So is, is there any role of shortening to treat limb limb discrepancy? Of course, if that's what they want. As a short person, I have to be very careful that I'm not biased when I'm talking to these patients. So um, my best example of that is I had a child um, who completely normal, just had an idiopathic limb length discrepancy of three centimeters. I, she's not of great stature, 
but she did not want a shortening. I mean, she did not want a lengthening. And I said, okay, you're gonna be, you know, shorter than me. Um, and she said, I don't care, it would be easier. And I told her, I'm like, you're enough to get a, I'm gonna use a nail to do it. Are you okay with that? Yes. The next patient I did that day was an arthropodic child with um, a hip dislocation with a limb length discrepancy could not stand wearing her, her shoe lift. And I was thinking, well, it would be perfect for me to shorten you and lengthen the other girl. But I ended up lengthening the arthropodic child who um, very slowly, very, very slowly and shortening the other one. And they both are happy as can be. Neither one wears a shoe lift. And you know, luckily in that case, there weren't any complications. But yes, I think that it's a personal preference. And I definitely do a lot of epipsiodeses um, I am using, even in the, the deformities that are less than two centimeters though, I do give the option of both shortening with an epipsiodesis. If they're skeletally mature, I will talk about just fixing the shoe or doing a shortening. And the third thing is now I can, I feel pretty comfortable saying I can lengthen um, your leg for a small deformity too. So any uh, red flag signs on an x-ray uh, which will uh, tell you that this might uh, go for a fracture, the regenerate might fracture, or it might bend. And second part is, what red flag signs do you tell the parents to look after and come back to you, uh, just to uh, prevent the complications? For the regenerate, I, I mean, there are many ways that you can measure the, the quality of the regenerate. Um, so you can use that. I look for the cones. I look for how, much, how many cortices I have um, formed. I look for cyst formation. Um, I look for um, asymmetry of how the um, regenerate is forming. Um, in my fibular hemimelia case that I presented, there was a, a, a line from where I externally rotated the foot. Um, and I think that should have been a better telltale. It just was not, there wasn't uniformity in that regenerate. Um, in terms of telltale signs from having a patient at home, um, I look, they are very well educated on what to look for for a pin um, track irritation versus infection. Um, I am able to prescribe via the internet um, antibiotics. They usually send me a picture and I say, hmm, I don't like that. Um, if they're having pain, um, that's, that's unusual. I mean, especially now I use a lot of Tylenol and you know, we've had a huge opioid epidemic here. So we really are very, um, we're finally getting smart about how, how to prescribe opioids. So if they're all of a sudden needing more pain, that is a red flag sign. If they're having fevers also, swelling, bleeding around the pin site, or if, um, if the family heard, sees that the frame does not look like they first thought it would. The, with a very um, large child that, um, with blounts, um, his frame, the whole thing shifted up. And I looked at it, I said, that is not right. The family hadn't really noticed it. They thought it looked a little different. I don't know how you miss that, but it, it happens. So um, fever, pain, pain increasing despite giving medicine um, and the overall alignment of the leg changing would be big signs. Or if they can't straighten or flex their leg or ankle or the hip hurts. Yeah, today, all of these situations, anyway, the pa you know, patient and the parents get worried. So they're they are going to uh, contact. In fact, when I started my practice, uh, when mobile phones just uh, came out, I had my mobile phone number on all my visiting cards so that uh, if patients need to contact me, because at, at that point in time, I was like a single uh, resource for the patient. So they should be able to contact me uh, whenever needed. And those were the days when, you know, even incoming calls were charged 16 bucks a minute or something like that. But no matter, they should be able to uh, get in touch with me in case they have any worry. And I would tell them that I would rather you call me and uh, with a sort of false alarm rather than sit at home and worry about, you know, should I do this? Should I do that kind of stuff? Today with WhatsApp and everybody having... Um, this thing, it's, it's hardly a problem. They, they themselves will, you know, take a picture and, and send it to you, doc, this is what is happening. And then like she pointed out, uh, I, I would start with, if it doesn't look like infection, start with anti-inflammatory for a couple of days, 
see if that settles the pain if not then um, uh, antibiotic and stuff so you can do a lot of uh, looking after the patient caring for the patient now with um, with with whatsapp and we've been doing a lot of this so called teleconsultations uh, even before covid started because patients yeah. are far away um, and we want to keep uh, monitoring them because all of these things are important patient goes away lengthening is completed but patient is not walking well he is going to take time to for that regenerate to consolidate so x amount of time has passed and patient is not walking well i'm worried i see to it that you know he he or she starts walking properly why there is not they are not walking so all of that i think there's not so many red flags in the sense that uh, all these other troubles which patients have they will themselves come and complain to you i agree with you all my patients still have my cell phone so they can get a hold of me quickly because i don't think my residents that are in the hospital have as much knowledge as i do they they weren't typically in the case um i, I don't want to... sometimes they're not as invested also you know in the yes. patient yes the way we are so read and mangal you know i just wanted to discuss one approach you know so we always people have a high rate of complication with lengthening so what we did we had a clinic manager who's a you know simple nurse who is given the responsibility of calling up all the patients once a week and she will note down you know do you have pain how is the range of movement and they will send her a uh, photographs of range of movements on whatsapp and we found that we were able to pick up some of the complications even before the patients complain so you know this is a proactive approach and second can be a reactive approach you know having patient complain to you and then you act on it so do you think it will i i starts my saral i start my proactive approach in theater in the sense that uh, a lot of stuff which can cause uh, pain later on for example skin tethering etc etc um i will spend half an hour extra in the theater because i know if i don't get this right i'm going to have trouble with the patient calling me back later um in addition of course uh, proactively if if a patient hasn't contacted me for a while then we will try and find out okay you know it strikes me why hasn't that patient called but yes what you say is also a, a good approach have if you have somebody who's um constantly sort of regularly calling patients to check we've not really had that much of so we did this from the ponsetti approach you know ponsetti approach yeah. where they have a, a, a social worker who will call up the patient who defaults and we found it good for this and growth modulation both because patients do default and they do take <laughs> that's the worst like. growth modulation that that doesn't come back i'm like how could you didn't you see his leg is going the other direction but i agree with you i do bring patients back um i it's beginning to be a little bit more difficult we're not seeing as many patients in the clinic per day and i can't sneak one in um because of covid um and the regulations of the hospital so i usually see patients every week um i'm now stretching i got to stretch them out to 2 weeks but that really stresses me out so i i like your approach i think it's great now now that we're talking of covid it would be interesting to know a couple of things one um what patients are you doing now are you doing uh, electives number 2 do you do preoperative testing for covid in these patients and three yeah. what is the uh, kind of ppe that you use for these patients so um one every so we are do, we're pretty much up and running we um in the beginning we broke down into four teams so three teams were at home doing telemedicine and we were pretty active in telemedicine but it just ramped up by a thousand fold um once covid started so we really broke down things we had a very um we had a triage nurse we had people getting siphoned into an urgent clinic and um kind of an operative semi urgent i mean a very urgent clinic and an urgent clinic and are we were allowed to do some cases that were necessary and now we they um have made the days longer in the OR so we can operate a little bit later um every single patient that is going to have surgery will have a covid test 
um, within 72 hours of coming to the hospital. We have a separate COVID operating room and there's a whole protocol that goes in from, it does change every day. So don't ask me too many details um, on how that patient with, with we had a, a, a skiffy the other day that was COVID positive. Um, and she had to be put on a special floor. She was taken to the operating room the next day after um, into a room that is only for COVID patients. Um, so that's how that's happening. In the PPE, the surgeon's not in the room for the intubation um, of a COVID positive patient. They have face masks, I think in N95s um, in the operating room if the patient is known to be positive. If they're not positive, if we are doing you know, a semi-elective or elective case um, on a regular patient that's been tested negative, we use just your typical eye protection and mask. Eye protection as in a visored mask? Yeah, and I am, uh, so I, I wear a mask all day. I, the CDC regulation or suggestions now really push us to wear um, eye protection in the clinic, which I probably should have been doing all the time because you never know who's positive. And now people are a little bit, um, you know, in the US people are pretty much thinking that COVID went away, even though our cases are rising still. Um, so I'm you not don't sure. Have enough, don't have enough what was that? You don't have enough bleach in the US, your president said? Uh, no, we, but we do have injectable bleach and UV <laughs> light that is really good for us. Um, but if we don't have that, we have hydroxychloroquine, no problem. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, my, um, question, my question was for, for these non-COVID positive patients, uh -huh. uh, there you use standard stuff. Standard. But there yes. is about a 30% uh, false negatives, right? Yep. So you, it's, you, know, you still are relatively protected with your regular surgical mask. Um, I won't let anyone in my operating room without eye protection because I think it's not very smart and I think it's an OSHA regulation. Um, I, I'm not their mother, but come on. Like when, when in the first weeks we had a child that was from a very high COVID area and I watched the anesthesiologist looking over the child without a mask on. And I said, what are you doing? I know we're just putting a spica cast on, but you're intubating the patient. Oh no, the fellow's intubating. I'm far enough away. I'm like, you're one millimeter away from that patient's mouth. Are you kidding me? So um, I don't know, everyone to each his own, but I am trying to be very diligent about eye protection and masking and protecting my trainees. Okay, get back to lengthening now. Orthopedics. <laughs> so, yeah. So, what is the role of oral alendronate uh, for a poor region, right? And uh, secondly, what is E stem? Uh, the audience wants to know what exactly does the E stem do? Um, gosh. Um, so, starting with the bisphosphonates, I do not think there's. Um, in the Yopes paper um, that I just reviewed, I, I don't think bisphosphonates alone are the best, are, are we can say that that's your best for regenerate. You know, it blocks your osteoclast, uh, your osteoclast from functioning, but I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that, that that's enough. So some, some studies showed using uh, some bisphosphonates and BMP, again, I'm not an expert on this, um, just because I haven't had to use it. Um, so I just, I think you have to be careful. I think that there are other things that you can do before using those bigger drugs. And if you, one of you have had more experience with using bisphosphonates and lengthening, I have with CPT, I definitely use them there, but not here. And I think you guys had a talk from Dr. Paley on CPT recently. Um, yeah. I, I, I think that procedure is great. And then I throw the whole kitchen sink, the BMP, the bisphosphonates. Um, but in lengthening, I just, I'd rather look at, at both my, the patient that I'm, look, that I'm trying to lengthen and trying to figure out what's going wrong. If it's something as silly as you've got, you know, two grandparents in the house smoking, they're get, that's a, a reason, you know, that's an easier, less expensive thing to change. Uh, what was the second question? Oh, the E-STEM. Uh, E-STEM. Um, Again, something that I have not personally used, um, but they're trying, you know, Eastim typically tries to you know, bring blood supply to there and 
increase with those with the electricity to have bone cells heal better. But um, I don't think alone. I mean, there are some promising studies, but not. I, I wouldn't. I would try to fix the problem before I went and put that on as my sole reason, your know, sole way to to improve my regenerate. Uh, maybe somebody else has more experience than I do with that. No, I, I have. It, this is what electricity, not yes. not the ultrasound. Right. No, I I, don't, I I have no experience with it, and I I that's why a lot of these uh, al so-called allied uh, pharmaceutical and other interventions, I am very very wary of because industry in general is not interested in the patient. They are interested as in the patient as one more bakra, you know, one more uh, thing that we can put our product uh, into. So when industry comes out with science, you have to look at that very, very uh, skeptically. I am I am not a big fan of. Uh, yes, we have to work with them, and and uh, cooperate, and you know, get things together. But otherwise, a lot of these things I think should be looked at skeptically because they keep going into a circle ultrasound right. once upon a time oh it's it's the next best thing after sliced bread then it is useless now again it's kind of they're trying to show as if it, it works and i think that going back to those you know the if we go back and just think uh, what would elizarov have done if we go back to the principles and we make sure is it an alignment issue is it a stability stability issue? Yeah. Is there an infection issue? If you don't, if you jump to the, well, how can I fix this by giving them a drug or, or putting a device on and you don't fix the problem that is causing this issue with the regenerate, then you're going to come up, sh you're going to come up short and um, easy is not always best. So one minor complication I have experienced while putting a femur frame is the proximal most shan spin, the wound gaping occurs very frequently. The rest of the shan spin won't gape, but the proximal most will gape without any infection. So how can I prevent that? So, I mean, I think you see a lot of fat necrosis in that area. Um, I I mean, I'm not pushing a product or, and I'm not saying my, like I said, if I interviewed 10 of us, we would all have different pin site, you know, pin care protocols, um, but, in that area, I watch very carefully. I, I, you know, I, I make sure that if if the pin is here and this part's in the bone, I, I don't let them push the skin away from the bone, especially because I use um, HA coated pins now. So that is actually um, our physical therapists teach them how to do pin care, and I had to to make sure I got to all the physical therapists who were teaching. You know, make sure you get every bit of crust off, and I I use a lot of silver dressing. Um, I think it's very easy to put on there. Our, the one I use is, um, it's called Mepilex AG. It's a foam, it's a sponge that has silver in it. And I think it's absorptive and can help decrease. The other thing is, you know, taking gauze and decreasing the friction, either gauze around it or a sponge. Um, I, the, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. There's a, the, those Elizarov sponges, which are very expensive, are really the same material as if you go to a, 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 a store and buy a makeup application sponges. And I can tell all of you use makeup all the time, you know, putting your foundation on. But if you did, these sponges are great because they're absorptive. You can wash them and they can, you can put them along your pin and they can decrease friction. Yeah. One, one of the things that I, I do is um, the, the issue is that your skin is, is there and it keeps, you know, pistoning, uh, in and out, as well as there may be up and down motion. Now, if you restrict the movement between the soft tissue and the pin, you are less likely to have uh, that kind of trouble. And one of the things I use is uh, ask the patients to buy small Turkish towels. Turkish towels because they are kind of bulky in terms of... And then after they've done the pin site care, wrap that pin with a Turkish towel. So the Turkish towel basically takes up the space between the frame 
and the skin pushes the skin a little away. So if you have multiple strips like this, they can be washed and boiled and reused again, just as a stabilizer, like uh, Reed was talking about the foam. You can use and foam. And I use this, see this binder clip? This is a big one. Yeah. And it, I can put that on the pin and slide it down to hold a Turkish towel or a sponge in, in place. And it costs about a penny each. And this, this is actually a makeup application. It's in a funky shape, but this spongy material, if I cut this or I found ones that were circular, it's the same thing. It's just not medical quality. But um, if I use the combination of that and these, it works. Principle, principle is reduce pin skin motion. Yes. Uh, so the last question is, uh, can you do a bifocal lengthening with a nail? With a nail? Um, well, I, so I don't usually do, so you could do a transport, but that's shortening one side and lengthening the others. I, I don't think I've ever tried that. I have definitely done deformity correction with an acute osteotomy and a plate fixation distally. I didn't use this example. Um, I was trying to get the precise nail out of the picture as much as I could, but we use a lot of them. Um, and then I'll use a, do a proximal lengthening. Um, that is definitely wrought with some problems. You need to anticipate where your deformity is going so you can have a perfect outcome. Um, but I have not, I mean, I think if you do a fix it or assisted lengthening or a lengthening over a nail, you, you might be able to do that. I have not personally done. And I don't really see much advantage for it also. One of the advantages yeah. of a, a, a bifocal lengthening is that Yes, time may be saved, but if you've got an internal device, which is not really giving you trouble, it, I don't think it makes too much of a difference whether it's taking, uh, you know, one and a half months or three months for the lengthening to uh, complete because patient otherwise is pretty comfortable, pretty uh, functional. So maybe it's, it's a, a solution in uh, search of a problem really. I do a lot of, I mean, I do a lot of bifocal lengthenings and with deformity correction, but it, in things like fibular hemimelia, where I feel like there's deformity, there are two levels of deformity and I can do a, a little bit of correction, but usually there's one place that is really being lengthened. Yeah, that's and, the lengthening place. That's right. Yeah. And the and deformity this side you do. Just deformity. Yes. Anything I can do to minimize problems, because some of these deformities, especially on these arthropodic kids or neurologically impaired kids, is they're tough. And I, you know, I want it to be simple. It's never simple, but I try. So, uh, Kirti, any more questions? No. <clears throat> questions. Questions will never end. And uh, yes. so there are questions <laughs> to which there are no answers, but uh, I suppose yeah. we need to. Some good thought. End end this webinar. So Reed, thanks a lot, you know, because this is one topic which can actually become a pandemic. There are lots yes. of lengthening which take place. And if you really don't take care, nothing stops <laughs> it from becoming pandemic. And what really is required, you give us all the recipes to prevent the pandemic. One is lockdown, put a very stable frame. And as Mangal and you said, you know, the, the technique really starts, uh, the prevention starts in the operation theme. So lockdown in the operation theater, very, very important. And restrain. Restrain is very important. Restrainment. So don't do big lengthenings, do small lengthenings. And containment of the skin by preventing the skin tethering and, you know, putting dressings well and taking care. And very important thing is uh, the surveys, you know, the surveys people do. You talk to patients and find out. Give them your phone numbers. Very important tip we got from both of you. Patients should be contactable. So if a small doubt exists, you pick up the complication early and treat. And finally, if you if you do all this, certainly it will flatten the curve. And we must remember it will flatten the curve, but complications are there to remain like COVID. And we must take care of them in the beginning so that we don't face the lockdown. So thank you very much for a very interesting webinar. Thanks, Mangal, Kirti, thank and Vivek. You. Very, very interesting. And uh, after learning the complication, maybe we'll now learn how to put the frames when John Hasenberg talks to us next time.
and thank you he's the much. best he's the best so thank you I, it was really an honor to be part of this and um i i want to jump on to the john hertzenberg talk he really is a fabulous teacher and truly who i've i've really tried to make him as my mentor and role model so thank you all so much and it was nice to meet you all virtually again some of you i've seen before but um hopefully we'll see each other at a live meeting soon um and thanks thank you and before thank we you. end i just want to thank you mention that if you have missed any posse webinars they are all available on posse website www.posse.in and they are also available on author tv uh, online.com so you can still visit them anytime you want and with this we end this webinar thank you very much thank, thank you all. and bye let's bye. thank, thank uh, ashok and thank neeraj you. for their wonderful help thank you ashok and neeraj thank you bye 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 -bye. Uh, Dr. Nichols, do you want us to send you the link of Dr. Hersenberg's webinar when it is there on fourth of July? Would you Would you mind? Yeah, yeah. I we love, just made I you love the link. Mail you the link. Okay, fantastic. Okay. If any um, and if any other questions come up from anybody that I can possibly answer, please okay. you know, be feel free to use my email. Um, it was really okay. lovely doing this. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and it's this is a fun conversation. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Have a great yeah, day. Bye.